plus so much because it's this intersection between like dev and security, which is very important. Uh, how many people here are primarily what you do is write software or manage a team that writes software? Okay, a couple. And uh, are the rest of you security? Anybody not one of those things? Soon to be security. Soon to be security. Nice. <laughs> it's a good transition. We need more of that, honestly, in AppSec. People who have been developers to, to kind of do the right. security work. So uh, the other thing I kind of want to know is uh, how many people are like all in AI is the future, this is what we need to do? A okay, couple? How many are kind of skeptical of the whole thing? Mm. How many are like, oh, absolutely not? There you go. <laughs> And that's the thing, right? So as security practitioners and as developers, like it's happening, like no matter how skeptical we are, no matter how we feel about it, it is a thing that's happening. It poses new and novel risks. They're not always what we expect them to be. And part of that is the nature of the technology and part of that is the culture that comes with it. It's not always being written by software engineers and those kinds of things. So I wanna talk a little bit about that today. Of dependency management is hard enough and AI adds a whole new set of complexities. And you know, why am I talking about this? Um, this was secretly taken in our uh, development organization. Uh, our company, Endor Labs, we focus on dependency management. That's kind of our bread and butter, right? We do all of the AppSec stuff that you would expect that an AppSec company to do, uh, but dependency management is really our bread and butter. And we, we started with this idea of it's hard from a security standpoint and it's hard from a developer standpoint to effectively manage dependencies. And by dependencies, I mean OSS libraries, I mean LLM models, which we get from ATM machines, um, and like all the other stuff that's involved in software development, the actions in your CI, all that stuff, right? So this is a, a topic kind of near and dear to our heart as an organization. And we care a lot about like accuracy and completeness and actionability of things. So a lot of what I'm gonna to talk to you today was us solving problems for our customers of trying to find like, there's dependencies that we're not seeing. What's going on here? What's the difference? Why are we? Why are these things hiding from us? Right. So why me specifically? Um, I've been doing AppSec for 20 years at this point, uh, which is a little scary to say. Uh, when, I, when I started in AppSec at, at US Bank, they, they didn't have a term for it yet. Uh, it had to be coined. Um, I've built and run security programs in a number of places. I've been a practical researcher, so I'm not doing the go hack your thing and then file a CVE research. It was building products, building programs, building tools, building things to try to make the environment better. Uh, I started up my life as a software engineer though, right? So I, I really do understand the other side and generally just a huge nerd, mostly Star Wars and coffee, uh, but also software, right? I kind of work today at the intersection of DevSecOps, right? And how do we, we're all on the same side. So this is also near and dear to my heart of how do we help developers and security professionals see what they need to see to make smart risk decisions? So when I talk about AI code, what does that mean to you? When I say like, what's in your AI code, what comes to your mind? ChatGPT. Okay, ChatGPT, Copilot, right? So there's, there's pieces to it, right? So I have this brand new shiny AI enabled product and it's, I wrote some code for that. How much code did I write? 10%. <laughs> Actually, it's about right. Yeah. You also bring along libraries, the model, right? You probably didn't train your own model. Maybe you did. And then there's like configuration, all the stuff that you do to try to secure your code. So the thing I want to talk about today is mainly this libraries bit, because that's the thing that seems to get the least attention when we talk about the unique security requirements of AI environments. And this has to do a lot with how package managers work. And there's a lot of misunderstanding, I find, even among software engineers, of how it actually happens when you add a dependency to a software project. Because the package manager, if you're running Maven or NPM or whatever, it's completely disconnected from the runtime and the compiler. They kind of share information a little bit, but they're very, very loosely coupled. Two ships passing in the night, as it were. And so the kind of way this goes is like developer starts a project, picks a couple of dependencies, makes a manifest file. POMXML, requirements of text, whatever the case may be, right? And they're not specifying all the time a specific version of the project. They're saying, I want something, you know, I want TensorFlow greater than 4.0, or whatever the case may be, right? And the package manager is left to kind of figure it out. And that's not all the dependencies that they actually have in the project, because each of those software projects they're adopting also have their own transitive dependencies. And those have dependencies on the one down, right? 
Uh, the deepest I've found in my analysis so far was a dependency tree that was 72 layers deep. <laughs> <laughs> Guess which language? JavaScript. 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 Yes. <laughs> of course. It's right? got to be. <laughs> yeah. And it's cultural difference. Like how big this is is very cultural differences. In Java, we tend to write big monolithic libraries that do everything, and you use about 12% of the code. Right? In JavaScript, it's very because of the web deployment model and the development of that back when the internet was slow. Um, it was encouraged to have very, very small, very specific dependencies. So you're much more likely to use every dependency you pull in, but it means there's a lot of them. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a different set of, of problems and hassles. Mm -hmm. And then like, once you have that kind of defined, you run the package manager, and the package manager goes and figures everything out and shoves them all in a directory. Right? That, that is your source of truth as best you can, is there's a directory of dependencies. And then your runtime your compiler uses that directory to figure out what to load. Now, does this seem fragile to you? <laughs> <laughs> right? And the, the problem is things get out of sync. They just do. The manifest file stops reflecting reality. It's completely unavoidable. It's going to happen. Nobody does a perfect job of this. And there's reasons for it, right? I'll import a new dependency, and I'm not necessarily putting, updating the manifest file, because I can install the dependencies different ways. I can install them at the OS level. I can pip install and just forget to regenerate my requirements, right? It happens all the time. I can sometimes just rely on them being there, right? C application. How many people have live C in their in their uh, dependency of the tree? Everybody depends on it though. And anybody who's like had their stuff try to run in an Alpine container when they're expecting live C knows the pain that that can cause. So I'm just trusting it to be there in the environment. Uh, in some cases, I pulled this dependency in just for testing purposes. Shouldn't go to production at all, but it does. Right? Storybook in JavaScript is a great example of this. It's meant to be a helper for writing use cases for testing. But people use pieces of it for production all the time because it has some really nice convenience functions. And so you end up with this, it's only for dev thing that you're ignoring, but it's not in the manifest file, but you need to put it in production or things break. Uh, sometimes I stop using a dependency. Those of you who are developers, are you really good about hygiene going back to your manifest or removing stuff you don't use anymore from the manifest file? <coughs> yes. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> I have a check that does it. Yeah. Right, so you have a tool, right? But generally speaking, like this happens all the time, right? Where you're packing and sending stuff out all the time and you're not actually using it anymore. You might even have the import statement still, but you're not actually using any part of it. So what's in your manifest file and what you're actually using for dependencies don't necessarily match. And then when you run something like depth check or you run something like you know, the Maven depth tree, right, those kinds of things. You're supposed to be getting this tree of all your dependencies, but it's only kind of sort of true. And that's where the problem starts to come in, right? Is that your manifest can be outright lying to you. And if you're basing a security program on what's in your manifest files, which is what where most people start, right? Like, where, like you turn on Dependabot, it's looking at the manifest files, right? You get stuff like this. So this is, I know it's kind of an eye chart. This is TensorFlow, and you get stuff like this. TensorFlow, the open added baseline says, we're gonna install TensorFlow. Just install this GPU one if you got a GPU, and otherwise do this one, and by the way, you can kind of pick whatever version you want. Just pip install the dev, don't worry about it, okay? And there's a bunch of versions that'll work, but if it's the wrong version, it'll just break. So how do I know, as in like an ops person, what version of TensorFlow this got tested against? How do I know as a security person? Does that one have a vulnerability? Sure, is that the one that's installed in production? Is the one that's installed in CI? I don't know, it might be different, right? You'll never see that in a manifest file, right? If you are following the, the documentation for baselines, you'll never see TensorFlow show up in a manifest file because you don't have things to include it because you have installed it. It's going to go in my container. Don't worry about it, right? And your tools aren't going to see it. So this isn't, I, I don't want to pick on baselines like OpenAI is a great company. Um, you see this all the time in instructions for models, right? Hey, just, just pip install something, some stuff, <laughs> right? It, it'll be fine. And remember who's working on AI projects? Is it always software engineers? Yeah. No, it's a lot of researchers, right? It's, it's a lot of communities you wouldn't normally expect to be writing software. Sometimes it's often like a, a junior developer is like, 
hey, you know, I learned about this AI thing in school and this is my first job and I want to do the project. And they're like, great, you, we want to add it to our project, go nuts. And they don't, they necessarily haven't been inured into a proper software engineering discipline. There's no checks for this stuff in most environments. It'll be a shell script somewhere that installs this. I mean, good luck, right? You run a lot of stuff, check it, mixes it completely. So how are you gonna secure it, right? So we wanted to figure out, can we, we saw this stuff in, in our customer environments where like stuff we knew was installed, was that the code depended on, wasn't showing up. So what, what's the problem? How prevalent is this? This is just one weird thing. So we took a sample of our customers and they've been anonymized for obvious reasons. <laughs> and yeah, everybody's got a little bit of this, right? Most people have a couple of things that they're installing at the OS level or they're pip installing or something along those lines. And as you can see, it's a pretty good correlation between like how many of their dependencies are phantom and how, how many of their vulnerabilities are in those steps. Right? They, they pace each other pretty well. And then you get these outliers. Suddenly there's a ton of it. And we go, what's, what's different? Is it language? No, these people all use a ton of Python. A right, ton of JavaScript. Pretty, pretty similar languages. Is it company culture? No, they all have you know senior all the way down experienced people. Don't know what the problem is. Is it deployment model? No, nope, they all use containers pretty much on similar par. So what do you think it is? Come on, let's have a talk. Was, it, a, was it AI? <laughs> it's AI code, right? These, are, these companies were places that wrote a lot of AI code. So it tells us there's something real here in the culture of producing AI code. And until that culture changes and kind of catches up to mainstream software engineering practices, this is gonna go from a little problem that's on the fringes, which still important to solve, but it's not the end of the world, to a big problem. I mean, look at this. More than half in this company were just like, hey, we just pip installed it and rolled with it. They're in a container somewhere. We built the container separately from building the software. By the way, we don't use the same container for tests and production, <laughs> right? How are you supposed to run a security program on that? Or a QA program. Right. <laughs> so, like, and this, this happens for what reasons? They're like, oh, it's, it's provided by the system, right? I can trust that it's there. We have a culture in our organization of I know it's going to be in the container, I know it's going to be installed. You know, hey, I'm, I'm using the GitHub Actions default runners. They all have, you know, PIP and JQ and so these other libraries installed, so I can just rely on them being there. Right. Um, my deployment is a script, right? I do, I install a bunch of stuff, then I PIP install requirements text, and then I install a bunch of other stuff, and then I run it. And some people do that to try to stay up to date. Like, oh, I want every time the container launches, I want the freshest version of TensorFlow or whatever. But sometimes it's just to avoid, you know, some control somewhere that says, hey, you can't use that without approval. Well, fine, I'll just download it live, right? And it doesn't have the same supervision always because it's AI and it's, we gotta go fast, right? Uh, often, this is because things depend on a specific target platform. So like, well, we're gonna, do, we're gonna take this software project, we're gonna deploy it a bunch of different places, rather than trying to min, maintain variations on a requirements.txt file, I'm gonna let the script detect like, oh, I'm on an ARM64 thing with an NVIDIA GPU, so I'm gonna install the TensorFlow GPU package. But over here I've installed it, and I, I don't have a GPU, so I'm gonna install the, the ARM64 package, right, or whatever the case may be. So like, if a developer doesn't know how to do that within the package manager, they're gonna do what developers do best, which is solve the problem in front of them. Right, do the simplest thing that could possibly work, they're gonna put it in a script. They're gonna have their software warm booted, pull it from the internet, whatever the case may be. Right. And of course, like, we have this kind of storybook problem, right, which is, I downloaded this thing, it's really for testing, it's marked as test in my requirements, so my security controls are looking at it and going, well, it's just for tests, so I don't care. But I'm actually using parts of it in production, and that's not well documented, and surprise. Okay. And like, NPM is like the worst offender for that last one. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that are designed for testing that people are like, well yeah, because one feature of this whole dependency chain is something that's very important to me, and so I'm gonna just use it in production, and not tell anybody, and not put it in my manifest. Right, we'll just, it'll be in the container, it'll be fine. Okay. So of course, you know, it checks out. <laughs> And it poses some security challenges, right? I'm not just doing this up there to say, oh, you know, bad AI code stuff, right? It's just, it's different. The biggest one is the false sense of security because your tools don't find these things. <laughs> Most tools haven't thought this through. Right? They're reading the manifest file, they're going to town. There's a few exceptions, right? 
Um, this is one of the reasons, by the way, that people deploy container scanners a lot of the times, because they know their static tools are looking at manifest files, they want to see what's in the container. Now you have two problems, <laughs> right? Because now you're gonna correlate stuff, right? And it's like you, you've introduced another piece of complexity and you need it, but you've also added this thing and you're gonna, there's gonna be some stuff that falls through the cracks as a result of that additional analysis you need. Inaccurate compliance data. This is one I haven't seen bite many people yet, but it has bitten a few people I know. If you are required to produce a software inventory or an SBOM of some kind, that SBOM has to be complete. That has to include the dependencies that aren't in your manifest file because you depend on them. <coughs> now, most auditors don't know how to verify, so a lot of people are just outright lying or BSing their way through an audit, to be perfectly honest. But then you go get it bought, <laughs> and somebody does their due diligence and goes, hold up, you have all these things you're not reporting, what are you hiding? It's a bad day, right? And as auditors get more savvy, that they're going to start being able to find those things too. They'll spot check something, they'll find out you didn't report it. some dependency because it wasn't in the manifest file and now you are working against for a few months to go chase all this stuff down. Right. Dev prod differences. Where do most of your offset controls run? We guess CI, right? Maybe developer desktop occasionally. How many are doing runtime stuff in prod? One, right, not super common. It does happen, right? But it's because most people don't bother to adopt a runtime until they've got the other stuff solved, right? Because it's, it's got some holes, right? So it's a great add-on there. But, so I'm testing my dev environment. Guess what? I have a different version of this thing installed in production, and I have no business with <coughs> that. Oops. Now I go, I'm clean. I have a clean version. It's all up to date, except it's not in production. So why can't tools find it? Right? I just explained to you how Package Manager works. Like it downloads everything. Why can't why can't a tool look at it? And the reality is, is because it, it's a trust thing, right? So how can I get the fastest answer? And like most things in security, the the tool environment and like this is true of open source tools, it's true of commercial tools, right? It, it kind of starts with the what's the shortest path to fixing this problem and solving pain, right? As an asset person, I need to know what my dependencies are. My dependencies are the manifest, right? So. Tell me what's in the manifest. Oh, there's transit dependencies? Cool, go query Maven Central or whatever for those. And problem solved, right? I know what all my stuff is. And then you have stuff like a private artifact array that has different versions resolved differently, right? You have stuff where the scanner processes the rule for version differently than the real package manager does. You get all kinds of nuts, right? And that's the big, that's the root problem, right? Is that most tools in the space are trusting a manifest instead of looking at application context. If you have that limitation, the only thing you can really do about it is manually review, right? Spot check stuff. You know, if you're if you're building your security program, you got no money, so you're building it around OS dev check, right? Good tool, does a lot of cool stuff. You need to spot check, especially if there's AI code involved. You need to like go install this in a container somewhere. Go do a diff of libraries installed before and after. What do I actually have, right? Go inspect the runtime. Make it part of your pen testing process. Right? You, need to, you need to skip the, the trust the manifest part and understand that you are going to miss things, especially if you're following these kinds of practices. Right. Standard dependencies are one thing. That's a, set of, a source of false negatives. That's mostly what we've been talking about so far. They're you know, system libraries, runtime libraries, other scripts. Right? That's, that's what we call phantom. There's also misused dependencies. Right? So that's things like the test dev issue, right? I brought this in to, for testing purposes, but I'm actually relying on it for production purposes. I flagged it as test. It's being excluded from the security program because kind of who cares about test code? But turns out it's not just test code. Right? It's flagged incorrectly. Uh, direct use of transitives. This one drives me nuts. It's such a bad engineering practice, right? And we see it a lot in AI projects, but we also see it fairly often in other things where I've declared this Let's say I've, I've, I've said I, my package uses foo, right? So I download foo, I put foo in my manifest. Foo uses bar, that's great. I don't use bar, it's a transitive dependency for me. So if the developer goes, oh cool, bar is here, I'll start using functions from it, but I'm not gonna put it in my manifest. <laughs> <laughs> that's not ever gonna break, right? Like when foo <laughs> swaps out that dependency for something else, never happens. Fortunately, this one often just like breaks, but you know, if you, 
if you are the good kind of security person that takes availability of your system seriously as part of as part of your scope, then that should concern you. Uh, and then the unused thing, right? I stop using things and don't bother to clean them out. And it's especially tricky when you're talking about the fandom dependencies because they might be installed forever because they're outside of the normal like deployment process. They're just part of the container image and I'm not using them. Guess what? That's threat service I don't need. That's binary size I don't need. That's you know download bandwidth I'm consuming. And yeah, it might be a dime, but it adds up when you got 1,700 instances. <clears throat> so, you know, I've seen so many manifests that call for stuff and then you actually do an analysis and you're like, that's, there's an import statement. <laughs> so the, the automated tools offer won't catch it. You're like, oh, you're importing it, you're using it. Ah, except I never bothered to use it. Like IDs are getting better about this, like the tools are getting better, and so we're seeing it less, but it still happens. So how do you solve this? You gotta look at the program. You can't just look at a manifest file or look at it in situ. You have to actually look at how are developers consuming libraries, right? So we chose program analysis in an automated fashion. It's not the only game in town. Uh, you know, you can also do program analysis by assigning an AppSec engineer to do it. It doesn't scale super well. Um, some SaaS tools can do some, some of this. They're not usually built for it, so there's some limitations to be aware of. But you can apply different tools and techniques, yeah. So regarding the unused libraries or the dependencies that you mentioned about it, so runtime scanners are pretty good about identifying what's being used versus what's not being used, but they don't scan the unused side of things, right? So they just say these are these libraries are not being used at all. So I may not have to scan these and then just leave them alone. Yeah. Is that something that possibly I mean something you have um, that that's generally okay. Like if, if you can be confident that something's not actually being used, ignoring it's probably okay. Um, one of the difficulties with the runtime analysis is Everybody has a different definition of what used means. We run into this with terms like reachability too. Everybody means something slightly different. And none of them's really wrong or indefensible. It's just you've got to know which one your vendor means because you need to adjust your program to accommodate that, right? So like in the case of runtime analysis, it's going to find things that aren't being loaded. But guess what? If there's an import statement, especially in interpreted languages like Python, if there's an import statement, it is being loaded. Some of the code in it is being run during import. That doesn't mean I'm using it in a meaningful way. So like from a sanity standpoint and from a security standpoint, I want to identify those and like my developers should want to identify those and get them out of their code too, right? Like you're importing this but never using any of its functions, stop it, right? Because it's gonna get flagged by runtime every time. And then you're chasing down vulnerabilities that don't matter to you, you're wasting time and money. Exactly. No fun for anybody, right? right? Uh, so, <clears throat> Program analysis applied to this is basically like, instead of the source of truth being the manifest file, it's an important data point, but the source of truth is the code. I said source code here because, you know, I know my audience and not everybody's an expert, but any code, really, it could be the binary, it could be other things, but you need the actual application to analyze, to figure out what's really being used, but that's not enough by itself, right? You gotta analyze the code, create the syntax tree, right? Figure out how it's structured, figure out how stuff flows through it, and end up with a call graph, right? This tells you what's calling what. So I now know my first party code is calling this thing inside this third party dependency. That means I'm using it, right? And I can start to do, and I can start to ask questions of this graph like, hey, how long is the chain between my first party code and this transitive dependency 20 layers deep? If the answer is like one, that probably is actually a direct dependency and should be in my manifest, right? If I don't find any paths, I have a couple questions about why, but as a general rule, I can start to say, well, maybe I'm not using it at all. I have to go verify that. There's fun things like runtime injection that complicate this, but works 95% of the time. Then you gotta correlate that, right? And the correlation is the key part, and that's the, that's the thing that makes doing this by hand so difficult, because if you didn't have to correlate the dependencies used by the code by what's in the manifest and what the package manager downloaded, you know, those three sources, then you could probably do, like, Python has a built-in AST generator. You could probably write your own in a weekend, and you'd be good enough to get on with, and your AppSec team could do it, and be free, and it'd be open source. That's hard, that's time consuming, right? That's really difficult to do without a tool, right? Because you're, you're looking at different sources of data that represent the same thing in very different ways, and yeah, you can do it with a spreadsheet. It's gonna take you all afternoon for even a simple program. 
So you really kind of need a tool that understands those, those things. And then the idea is to create a unified view of your application. Once you have that, you can ask it all kinds of interesting questions, including, am I using things I don't see in the manifest file? Right, it becomes very easy to ask it. <clears throat> so this is a technique that you can apply with a mix of open source tools, stuff you write yourself, human analysis, right? This doesn't require a particular product. Obviously, I'm biased. I think ours is the best, <laughs> <laughs> right? So otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you. But you don't need Ender Labs technically to do this, but we're the first to do it all automated from tip to tip. That's the difference, right? The technique's valid regardless. So I'm going to walk you through an example in Python. Um, I want to put something out here, though. Like, every slide you've seen so far has had a Star Wars reference. Anyone pick up the Star Wars reference on this slide? Yeah, the runway and the... Good guess, but no. This is a ball python. Its phase, its color marking, is called stormtrooper phase. Cute! Deep cut, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, if I was analyzing a Python application by this, this is what I would do. I'd, I'd see that there's an import of the dependency, I'd generate a call graph to it, and I'd be like, okay, is it actually being used in a meaningful way? Right? That's the first step. I can do that with open source tools. I can do that by reading source code and my, making diagrams. Right? Then I gotta do this again for every dependency it has. So I need to build that whole dependency tree and connect all those call graphs together. One of the harder things to do, right? Reading your own code is easy. Reading random open source projects written by different people with different styles. <laughs> <laughs> all the, the folks here who are AppSec folks, how comfortable would you be doing this work? <laughs> we don't have the people, right? It's a real problem. Um, and then like, you compare it with versions installed, right? This is what I'm expecting. I see that I'm using TensorFlow. Which version of TensorFlow is being installed in a given environment? This is tricky, because if you do it in CI, it tells you what things are installed in CI. If you do it again in prod, you might get different answers, right? And this is where you start to have that of like, you need to be able to do it early, so you can get out ahead of this stuff, but you also need to be able to validate that what's true in CI is true in production. And that's not a problem you're gonna solve with tools generally. I mean, runtime analysis can help spot things for you a little bit, but this is a cultural change, right? To get production to match dev well enough for security purposes, you need to have controls in place that make sure, like, you need to be able to spot check, but you also need to make sure that, like, hey, if you guys are using this kind of container image for your CI environment, you should use the same container image for production. And, you know, you can install different sets of tools, but I need visibility into those through manifests, through other things, right? And you need to have some kind of you know, as part of your post-ship process, you need to be able to at least spot check, right? If not using a runtime tool to kind of help you find those things. Runtime tools are tricky for spotting this kind of thing. You've really got to do your research. Everyone claims it. There's often a lot of constraints. It's very important to understand that when you're making a purchase. I don't sell a runtime tools, so I can tell you this, right? <laughs> um, you got to be very, very careful to understand how they're doing that analysis. They're all, all the approaches are fine, but how you're going to run it changes dramatically. And there can be very big culture clashes if you're not careful about understanding that before you sign the contract, right? And then of course the last thing is correlation, right? You have to correlate those results that you find across multiple data sources to present you with a single view. <clears throat> it's too confusing otherwise. You know, this, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had, you know, cheap or free tools tell me I'm using a particular version of TensorFlow and it's be like, you're using five versions. I don't think I'm using five versions. They were trying to solve this phantom dependency problem by looking at all my whole system to see what was installed. Well, I have a lot of virtual environments, I'm sorry, <laughs> right? And you know, different things are different components. You know, my CI build system is building 15 application components with their own dependencies, and they get confused. So that correlation is the only way you can get a handle on which app, which component is using which thing. So that's a very, very important like strategy. And if, if your tool doesn't do it natively, or doesn't do a good job natively, you have to figure out a way to do it after the fact, right? It would actually be a really good OWASP project, actually, <laughs> to go through like Serif results and try to make correlations. Because then, then you'd have correlation for every every tool. That'd be awesome. And then like doing this has knock-on effects, right? How many people have to generate S bomb for clients? Is that hitting you guys yet? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, right? Um, almost everybody has to have a software inventory somewhere along the way if you deal with any kind of compliance. I don't know, how many people are PCI? 
flips to PCI. Just one. Surprise. Yeah, PCI requires that you have a software inventory. You don't need to express it as an SBOM yet, <laughs> but you have to have the inventory that supports it. And you kind of get that for free if you have a good correlation engine, right? Because that's what you did, is you created an inventory and you're asking it questions to figure out security stuff, right? So you do get add-ons for compliance and for just general like management. So I'm gonna give you a really brief shameless pitch, right? Because I mean, they are paying me to be here tonight. <laughs> This, this, whole, this whole problem, this research around how to solve this came from trying to make our product support it and give, give accurate answers. So we do that, right? I'm not gonna spend half an hour showing you how unless you're really interested in it, but the basic thing is we can find this stuff like where baseline requests what version of TensorFlow and we do it by following that strategy, doing program analysis at build time to figure out what you're actually using, building a correlation. Basically, we automated what I just showed you you need to do. Right. So that's, that's my pitch for that. Um, I know I went fast, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. Questions, comments, arguments. I'm not within like soda throwing distance. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is kind of a, a basic question, but um, with your clients, I, I understand they have to produce an SBOM. Mm -hmm. um, why, this is, sound really strange, but why do they care that the SBOM is, is exactly correct? Like if it, if it requires TensorFlow and the SBOM and the product requires TensorFlow and the versions don't exactly match, who is that hurting? The question becomes, do you have vulnerabilities that impact you, right? So if TensorFlow 1.14 is a critical vuln and 1.16 doesn't, it really matters which one of those I'm using in production because that's the difference of my production code is unsafe versus is it is safe. So that's, that's why the version specificity matters. Like from a, at the end of the day, there's risk standpoint. There's also a management complexity. So if, if you as a security team don't have a good sense of what you actually have, what am I gonna ask you as a developer to do? Do you want tickets from security going, you got TensorFlow, it's got bugs in it, when there's nothing and you're up to date, right? It's a waste of time and money. So accuracy matters. And no, you cannot ask AI what your dependencies are. <laughs> <laughs> I have tried, it doesn't work. You can ask AI anything you want. It just doesn't mean it's gonna give you the right answer. Uh, how does someone say, like, we invented a professional idiot and now we've shoved it in every product? Well, is it, uh, you, you know what uh, Google's answer to how to keep uh, cheese on your, hot, oh, cheese on your hot oh, pizza? No. Glue. <laughs> I mean, it worked. <laughs> you guys haven't been doing that. Uh, or, or you want more vitamins? Eat a rock. What? That actually was correlated to a, what's the name of that news, college news, prank newspaper in oh, Chicago? The Onion. The onion. The onion. That was actually an article in the end. Oh, that they picked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, context, right? And then it's, it's kind of funny because. The irony for, for me of this being a thing that's so prevalent in AI, and it has a lot to do with like software engineering discipline and culture, right? Every software engineer ever, their main job is to solve the problem as quickly and efficiently as they can, right? And something that we as security people don't always get is that like developers do care about security in the pile of everything else that they're cared about. And you know what? I've never seen a software engineering org that sits there programmers down and says, what did you do to help the security of our product at review time? Microsoft is claiming they're gonna start doing that. It'll be interesting to watch. <laughs> but they're, they're gonna be the first, right? Outside of maybe a security product company. So like part of it is that, but the, the irony of the whole thing to me is that like AI's vision is in many ways to kind of like eliminate programming as a, as a routine job and just like only system level programmers will need to be around anymore. Because AI will just write what you want, you can just describe it. I'm not worried because product managers have to describe what they wanted, but you know, it is what it is. And the irony of it is, it's actually the worst software engineering discipline overall that I've seen in a really long time because most of the people who are working on it are not software engineers or they're junior software engineers who haven't been like taught the proper discipline. And people get really upset about it, like you're gonna fix it by getting mad at people, but like I think we just have to accept that this is how it's gonna be. It's democratizing programming, more people can program now but that means we can't rely on, oh, there are systems to prevent this from happening. No, you've got to check. You have to have real defenses. And I think it's the first time in AppSec where we've actually been faced with, we have to have real defenses for stuff and not just procedures. 
But it's not going away. Nope, not anytime soon. And Jane Doe now in accounting is going to use Copilot to do something that she really thinks is neat. Yep. Those one I asked for. And how are you going to keep that secure? Because it's going to, like, people are going to do it. Some of it's going to cause problems for the company, some of it's going to benefit the company. And we've seen this every time programming's gotten easier. It democratizes it, more people get involved. Software engineering is a discipline changes. Businesses want to gain the value of it being more accessible to more people. What are we going to do? We'll cry about it? No, our job is to keep it safe. Right? So we have to do it. We have to understand enough as AppSec people. We have to understand enough about how software systems work to spot stuff like this. Right? This shouldn't be a surprise, as much of a surprise to AppSec people, this whole phantom dependency issue, as it has been. And it's because like, the reality is so many of us, um, we, raise your hand if this happened to you. Like, how many of you were AppSec people who started out as developers? Started out as what? Developer, software engineer of some kind. How many of you started out as some other kind of security person? Okay. I actually did both. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. Right? The, that starting out as some other kind of security person is much more common in our industry. We need people so badly. The ideal career path to be an AppSec person is to kind of go through software development first because you need to understand systems like this, but we don't have the time or money to wait for that to happen. So we end up throwing people into AppSec who don't have time to learn that stuff. And then stuff like this is a surprise and it catches organizations by surprise. So it's very, very important, like having good relationships with that subset of AppSec people who do get this stuff, listening to them, because like it, this stuff matters. Forming good relationships with your developers. Like I'm always happy when I come to an OS meeting and you know a quarter to a third of the room are software developers. That's great. Network, <laughs> talk, <laughs> right? Like development doesn't always understand security. Security almost never understands development unless you had the luck of going through that path at some point in your career. You have to. We, we can't afford not to know this stuff anymore. Remember when DevOps was out there and security was just can't have that. There's no programming. It's too fast. Yeah. Right? We, we got to go through the waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it happened with Agile. It, and it's going to happen over and over again. This is another iteration of it. And like app tech programs have to be flexible. So that's, that's the other lesson here is this is a fairly fundamental shift. When people are writing AI centered projects, they're doing software engineering very differently. And it's not just the dependency management stuff, but they're not writing their own code in a lot of cases. <laughs> Not 100% anyway. And they're not understanding the code that they're putting into right. the repository. Larry Ellison School of Software Development. It looks good, <laughs> compile, ship it. Yep. Right? I Runs guess, on my machine. I guess I have a kind of a new question. I don't know a lot of this stuff. Um, so are you saying like a lot of libraries and stuff now are using, are written by AI? It's increasing. Okay. Um, we're certainly heading in that direction. I think open source libraries probably have the least amount of it because right. there tends to be, the, the weird thing is like having done this, this kind of you know, program analysis work for better than a decade now at various places, uh, the thing that always gets me is everybody who builds a security product starts by analyzing open source software because it's free and it's available and you don't have to have a customer in India, right? And they make certain assumptions based on the open source that's out there. And then they get to the real world of like corporate written software and it's almost always really, really much worse. <laughs> right? That is so true. There, there's, a, there's a degree of, like, if you're putting something out in the public for your fellow programmers to look at, you're going to be a little more cautious. Whereas if you just pay to get it out as fast as possible, YOLO, it's in the docs, right? Like, maybe. Yeah. Nobody so, wants to get embarrassed in public right. on GitHub. Like, what, what, what do you care more about? Something that's going to have your name on it forever? Yeah. Or something that is going to run the back end of some website that you're not even going to work there in two years, right? Or something that you ported to Java from COBOL, which used to be in Fortran, <laughs> and then now you're working on a project to port it to JavaScript, and you're like, look, it works, I don't care, I'm done, right? I've done, I've done that work, right? Mm -hmm. I've had the things where it's like, you know what, it works, I don't know why, I don't care, I'm leaving a comment that says, here be dragons, and I'm moving on with my life. <laughs> and we can't, as AppSec people, just assume that that doesn't happen your company's code is the worst code you will ever deal with. Mm -hmm. Even if your company really, writes really good software on average, it's, it's awful, I'm sorry, it just is. 
So is, is the challenge with, with code for AI, um, well, I guess this is really a question. I, I can just say, I think it might be kind of like, like it'll fix itself over time. <laughs> no, no. Here, let me hear me out. Yeah. So, I mean, there's this there's this big rush of people to, to do it, and a lot of them don't have software engineering skills. But you know, over time, should we expect that actually that may change? I mean, I've I've seen that in the data science space, right? So, like, data scientists are just kind of like writing terrible code that makes makes you want to cry. But you know, I've seen increasing number of books and kind of attention to like. Here's how to actually learn some software engineering concepts. Reproducibility is really important to data scientists. So, like over time, I think you know we could expect to see their code get better, and, and, to, and to adopt those those software engineering practices. To a certain extent, yes. I think when the I think when the gold rush is over for AI and it becomes more operationalized, you will see the average code quality go up. Yeah. But remember that the point of it is still to democratize, democratize programming, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the second order effects, which is as people start writing and publishing more code that is technically open source, right, even though it's not really an open source project in the way we would normally recognize it, and they're having AI do a lot of the code generation, what's the corpus that AI is learning from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Generally, the code that it finds in public. Yeah. What happens when more than half of that code was written by AI in the first place? Has anybody done machine learning work in the past? No. What happens when you create a feedback loop with, with a bad machine learning model? And generative AI is non-deterministic, so it's gonna start eating its own tail. And like, AI researchers know about this problem, they're working on it, maybe we get to avoid it, maybe they'll find a solution. But right now, it's like, if these trends continue, things are gonna get a lot worse before they get a lot better, I'm sorry. Uh, and it, it's, it's a good trend overall, it's just, it's new, it's very new and we don't really know how to get our hands around it. And it's changing too fast for a lot of traditional app stack programs to keep up with. Yeah. Sorry to keep asking so many questions, but uh, is anyone working on a really trustworthy AI code generation tool that would only have like a lockdown list of dependencies it could, it could use? In theory, yes. Uh -huh. The more you lock it down, the less useful it gets. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you could have a hundred yeah. dependencies or even a thousand dependencies that you it, it really, off, like you training data is one of those things, that, the thing with generative AI is it gets better at its job the bigger the corpus you give it to. Mm -hmm. So if you constrain it, you're tying the hands. So there is a balance, and like this is a big part of AI research right now, is balancing, you know, how do we constrain the, the training data and constrain the model to prevent the worst things without it crippling the whole thing that we wanted out of it. Like, that's part of why like we as a company have started to research things like LLM security and like how do you trust models, how do you vet models, what's your model confidence, right? All these kinds of questions that people aren't really asking yet. Like we're kind of looking at it and going like this is going to be important in the very near future. And I think you're going to start to see like anybody who does AI for federal government, like that, that's going to open, that door's going to open at some point. And it's this, man. They do good work, but you never know what they're going to come up with. Right? <laughs> like it, it's it's usually pretty good, but it's often surprising. Right? So like you, you can't you can't predict what's going to happen even six months from now in this space. So you have to figure out how to get your basics right. You have to figure out how to build programs that are flexible and understand systems like this, right? So that you can go, hey, I need to build my controls and processes so that when there are surprises, I have a way of finding that out. Right, and, and it, a lot of it has to do with like this. This whole problem fundamentally is that people who are building SCA tools, even depth check to a certain step, extent, right? Although it's getting better all the time, um, it's based on assumptions about how software is written, and it's often made by really good software engineers who are like, well, of course, a developer would just put all of their dependencies in the manifest. It's really important. Great. Now go give that to some you know offshoring firm that hires mm -hmm. the cheapest developers they can find who may or may not actually have ever gone to school for software development or have any experience and they just turn them loose and they're like hey go use copilot how do you think that's going to turn out like there, there's a chunk like any decent sized company has a chunk of code written by that kind of thing it's fine to a certain extent but you don't have control of that anymore all right so you like always imagine the worst developer you can imagine is going to contribute code to your project at some point 
either directly or through some kind of dependency tree. It's going to be in there, right? So you have to have a program that addresses that. I mean, how else are people going to learn, right? You got to write bad code to write good code. So how are you selecting your dependencies in the first place? All right, this is like fundamental program stuff that I've seen so many organizations get wrong. We want to we want to be gatekeepers for stuff. You can't be. You need to be able to respond quickly. But that's what shift left was supposed to be. It was supposed to be, hey, let's find stuff as early as possible so we can get out in front of it. It turned out we just were like, let's make it a developer's problem. Those of you who are developers, how well did that work? <laughs> Have you installed all of the security tool IDE plugins? No. Right? Nobody does that. What a waste. You got better stuff to worry about. So like shift left, not kick the ball left, right? It's still you're you're still accountable as an AppSec team, but you've got to get the tools as early as possible to process. You know, the, the biggest boon for AppSec has been CI, right? The fact that most developers are not building and testing on their desktop, they're letting CI handle it, means that we have a built-in spot where we can automate security tests. And what did we do with it? We made everything take eight times as long. <laughs> and then development's like, nope, not doing that, ripping all that out, right? So it has to, we have to get comfortable with realities. People are doing AI code generation. People are developing software in a different way. We can rail about it till we're blue in the face, but we have to respond to it, right? As long as it continues to be profitable for companies to do that, or even as long as your C-suite thinks it's profitable, whether it is or not actually doesn't matter, matter, right? Then it's something that you're going to be responsible for securing. So you've got to know how it works. Like you've got to understand how dependency management works. You've got to understand how a compiler works at some level, right? And like. The best thing that you can do as an AppSec person, if you don't have the software development background, is go learn to code. Go learn how this stuff works. Talk to your development teams, ask them. Most of them will be happy that you're interested. I agree, that's great advice. <laughs> Anybody control a training budget? <laughs> okay. Make sure your AppSec teams have a training budget allocated to learning about how software development works. The best way <laughs> is to do it. It is. Yep. You need the time, you need the environment, you know, you need, you need the tools, access to information. <coughs> Anything else you want to pick my brain about? So if, if you had to rank the environments, I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing that probably like the, the newer stuff like Go and Rust are, are pretty locked down and then Python and JavaScript. In terms right. of like open source ecosystem? Uh, no, in terms of just uh, the dev tools that requires you to have a manifest. I mean, that makes sense. Um, th there are, has, I think it has less to do with new and more how much did the language designers think about this, that this problem was their responsibility. Okay. So like the tools for Go make it very, very hard to have your manifest be accurate. It's not impossible, but that's because the designers of Go were like, this is important, this is an annoying problem, we want to build it into how the language works. Mm -hmm. Right, your Go code won't compile if you don't use any part of something you imported. That's great. I wish all I wish all languages did that. You can also turn that off, and people do. Right? Um, you know, so it has it has a lot more to do with kind of things like Python and JavaScript. They didn't start out having package managers because the language designer didn't think that, that was an important part of their scope of work. Right, you have the same thing, like the Java ecosystem's gotten really good about it in terms of making it as easy, easy as possible, but what, are, what development organizations that care about this stuff deeply are doing is they're not leaving it up to the languages. They're adopting things like Bazel that just take care of it across all the languages they use. Right? Why would you have to build first class Bazel support? Because right? we're seeing more and more of that. Cool. So like, it, it is important, and apps that can be a driver for good software engineering practices, and this is one of the big things that you can gain by making friends with your developers, there's overlap. I guarantee you there are developers who want to do things for good software engineering reasons that you also want them to do for making security's life easier reasons. Like adopt, like if you have a big mono repo, adopt something like Bazel that manages all this stuff for you. Everybody wins, and those developers will be your friends forever if they can't get their management to commit the time and you as a security person go, yeah, security wants that to happen too. Put your weight behind something that's actually good for engineering for once. Right, not just the sayers of no. I used to have a sign up in my queue that turned. You probably remember this. <laughs> it said it was a, a cat that looked exactly like our director of engineering, and it said, 
you're just doing, you know, doing the thing that was like resubmit in 30 days for further disapproval. And that's that's like that's how people <laughs> see security, right? And like when we can find those cases where we can enable, you know, like hey, you can go ahead and do AI code. You can go ahead and get AI code development outside of engineering firms if that's what you want to do, outside of engineering teams rather. Uh, but you just have to have these controls on. We're going to enable you to do that safely. That's what I want to see AppSec people being able to do. Like, hey, I have a tool stack, I have a process. It's a question of, if you want to do that, that's great. There's going to be a cost to it, but I'm going to help you do it safely. Right? That's a much better place than can I do it. I don't. If you have a culture of can I do this, please fix it. It should always be, I'm going to do this, what do I have to do to make that happen? I have opinions. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate everybody coming out, and uh, I am a local. I hope we make it to more of these. I'm glad they're kind of starting back up again. COVID was not kind to the, uh, to the local security scene. Brewery next week. Brewery next week, yes. So we are we are having another event at Surly Brewing, uh, jointly hosted with GitHub about accelerating software development and software security. Uh, it's vaguely Oktoberfest themed, even though Oktoberfest is actually over tomorrow, I think, officially. Um, so there will be beer and grub, and it's up at Surly Brewing. There are cards there with QR codes for registration. Please do register before you come. Seating is somewhat limited. We want to make sure we got enough for everybody. We'll send that out to the OWASP mailing list too. Absolutely. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.